Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Songwriters on Process podcast. My name is Ben Papari, and since 2010, I've run the Songwriters on Process website, where you can find more than 200 conversations with songwriters about the creative process. I'm not here to talk about tour stories, band drama, how a band got its name, or favorite foods. My goal is to treat songwriters as writers, plain and simple. This is an intelligent conversation about the writing process between two writers. And this week's interview is with Emily Haynes of the Toronto-based band Metric. Haynes is the lead singer, songwriter, and keyboardist for the band. They have a new album out called Formentera uh, that's fantastic. And uh, this was a deep dive into her creative process. Uh, A few things here, highlights from the interview. Haynes' father was the poet Paul Haynes. He has since passed away. And, uh, you know, I've always thought, gosh, I've interviewed 300 songwriters or so for this site and so few of them read poetry. And I think that's a natural fit. I mean, I'm not going to get into the debate between, you know, whether songwriting is poetry. Certainly there are differences when you write song lyrics, you're dealing with how those lyrics integrate with the music. But still, there are overlaps, the economy of language, precision, how words sound together, things like that. And so few songwriters read poetry. She has an answer. Well, she does. But uh, her and I said, why do you think it is that so few songwriters read poetry? And her response was, it makes sense. It's when you're in that world, you want don't want to go back into that world. And she referenced how they couldn't watch Spinal Tap. Spinal Tap was too close. And maybe poems are too close. So songwriters don't want to, you know, when they're not writing songs, they don't, they don't, they don't want to read more of that type. So there's that. But a few things did, did um, really stand out to me. One is when we talked about reading what she likes to read and she's a voracious reader, how she finds that those kind of the, the, the self-help books that, that deal with slogans. We have all those slogans, you know, the live, laugh, love type of slogan that those self-help books Almost the corny self-help books um, are a source of inspiration with the lines in there um, are a source of inspiration for her songwriting. So there's that. She is a big runner and loves to run and writing plays a big part in her creative process as it does mine as well. I love to run. I find that writing is a great way to work out the kinks um, and and the issues I'm having if I'm in a rut and she uses running uh, as a big part of her process, and the complete opposite, sleep. We talked about the study that I've mentioned many times, um, this study that that shows that in that time right before you fall asleep, there's a state, not in the middle of the night, but there's a state you're in right before you go to sleep, and that that can be an especially fruitful time, that haze for creativity. And they use that. This is the first time I think she's ever said this or d- d- told this story, but how they use that in the studio and she'll take a nap and she'll go to say to the band, great news guys, I fell asleep. And she said, and I'll quote her directly. um, You know, if I see one of my bandmates drifting off, I think, Oh, that's good. Something's going to come of that. I mean, most people, if you saw someone sleeping on sleeping on the job, you'd say, wake up, wake up, wake up. But for them, uh, sleep, they know that when they see people sleeping in the studio, that's good. And she says, one of the ways I know I'm going to be in the flow, you know, a good creative session is if I fall asleep in the studio. And how many people would say that about falling asleep on the job? So anyway, I love this. This is a great conversation. She was super fun to talk to. And with that, here is my interview with Emily Haynes of Metric. I always start by asking outside of songwriting, how much writing do you get to do? Whether it's journaling or it's kind of stuff here and there, are you strictly a songwriter? Or do you find that you like to do other types of writing? Uh, I used to feel that uh, there was more use to prose in my life than there is now. Really the only thing that I do that is seen by anyone is um, I do a newsletter that's quite passionate. Um, and, but, you know, I'm not on like Substack or anything. It's very much for metric fans. And, um, I think I've actually committed to the idea that the song is the ultimate form for me. And in fact, I don't like to 
cannibalize anything into like longer prose. I don't journal. Um, I just am moderately to severely obsessed with the economy of phrasing that probably was influenced by my father's writing style, but the idea that you can make these succinct little diamonds of meaning and not even, you know, trace the page. You'll certainly, right? Your father's a poet, so that, right, the economy of language is key. What has been, what lessons did your father, as far as strictly as a writer, what did he impart? And I'll, I guess another way of saying that is, if you read interviews with writers, poets, novelists, you know, anything, they talk about discipline. You know, no no poet or, or novelist says, yeah, write when you feel like it. You know, it'll come. They always say, butt in the seat, whether it's pages a day or words, you got to write. But for songwriters, I never hear that. So anyway, your take on that whole thing. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Because, well, so first of all, my father's love of language was a, a paramount to everything. So which was a really cool way to grow up because you just end up feeling like you're in this really fun game when you communicate and there's so much possibility, you know, just within the English language, but he also taught French. So there was all this interesting stuff going back and forth um, around, around what do you really mean and how do these words work in a minimalist way? Um, He had all kinds of like sort of boundaries, for example, he in- insisted he he didn't write poetry, he wrote poems, which I love that distinction because you know, think poetry, it's like floral, you know, sort of maybe, it, again, these are just a, the beauty of words, right? Poetry to me evokes like floral, indulgent, possibly purple prose-ish, like overindulgent, obviously millions of exceptions of poetry that are brilliant pieces of literature, but like, you know, and for him, it was like, I write poems, not poetry. I was like, amazing. Yeah. Um, and his preoccupation, which I think I share, and I guess we'll never know, he's moved on, he's passed away, but like whether it was his influence that shaped me this way or if we just had this in common, but is he was always trying to articulate things that were hard to hard to say. So... One that's like one of the simplest ones for me of his poems that I think you can hear a hint in my writing probably is a poem called um, Practicing Safe Emotion. And it goes, practicing safe emotion. It was the back of his chair she rubbed. Done. That helps me out. I I think that the things that he wrote would sort of drift in and out and I know everyone who's been familiar with his work has had this feeling even aside from his lyrics with Carla Blay and elsewhere, like he, you'd just be doing something and that the meaning of that would just kind of resonate in this really cool, like quiet way. Um, so in a way his writing was like songs, you know, they were, the, his poems were like songs without music. Um, when it comes to discipline, however, I fear, I fear that my dad and I have a, similar um, state of like I'm very disciplined I'm very strict I at harshest editor you know I once had the experience of editing down a piece to the point that there was just one word left and then I deleted that (laughs) whoa it was wild I was like it just kept getting smaller and smaller and then I was like okay everybody everybody's gone um emptied the room of words but uh he, he would go into his study and, um, you know, he'd drink and he'd, he'd go in and come out with, you know, four words that were like, and I do feel like I have a similar relationship at the piano where I don't know if you can call it discipline, but it's definitely that thing where I'll go, you know, I'm normally a, have a quite a structured life, you know, like eat well and exercise and all those things. And nice home, you know, keeping it together. But when I'm writing, it's like, it's like a heroin addict. I mean, I just, night will fall. I don't even know the dog isn't fed. The fire is not lit. I'm just hunched over in the dark, you know, at the piano, refining something that I don't even know what, you know, where it's headed. Um, And he worked in a similar way, which 
at this point in my life, I'm like, yeah, okay. It's probably not the healthiest thing in the world, but it's me. So do you think it's important to create in some fashion? I mean, along the discipline lines in some fashion every day? No, no, really? Okay. I, no, I actually think that that's, um, I don't know too much. Like there's a feeling I get when, when, again, I, it's really interesting that you're framing this, uh, in the context of conversations with, you know, prose writers, conventional, like writers on paper and songwriting, because like, you know, I, I feel like for me, it's like, something's got to come to me, um, for, for, for me to be worthy of the thing itself, if that it makes any yeah. sense. Like, it's like something comes to me, I don't know what it is. So I go to the piano and that is why, but I'm not just kind of wandering around musing, you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly searching, you know? Um, but that may come from being older, you know, like when, when I was in my twenties, certainly it was like, I you couldn't, I couldn't even have an experience without writing something on a cocktail napkin. You know, it's like, I just was like, it was like that feeling of sort of highlighting the whole book, you know, like it was like, I was documenting everything that would happen on a little, usually on a cocktail napkin. Um, but per, so perhaps it's more that I've, I'm in a new phase in my life where there is a body of work. And now it's like, I have new rules for what, you know, is worthy of people's attention and what I would do, what I should commit my time to. It is, you know, I read those, those articles and the, the interviews in the Paris review, you know, with writers. And I, I don't know, it's just at some point it dawned on me that this was so different. I mean, songwriters are writers, but as I said earlier, you know, I just don't interview many songwriters who say, yes, I write from eight to 10, you know, a few of them, you know, take a lunch break, play tennis, then write again. But every article with the every interview with those Paris Review writers, it's always that kind of discipline where they say, even if nothing is there, you got to do something um, so that at least you've got something to show for at the end of the day. But just I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to that. But it, to me, I find it interesting that songwriters see themselves differently than other types of writers. Totally. And. Yeah. And it's also perhaps related to the different phases of creation when it comes to songwriting and also the differences in how people do it. But like, whereas, you know, what you're describing uh, in the Paris Review, obviously these writers, it's like, you're, you know, it's bums and it's like sit down in the chair is, you know, is the thing. But songwriting doesn't really require that state. A lot of my sources are just from like being absorbed in something. And that's, you know, may sound ridiculous but is work um, yeah. if I'm framing it the right way. And then the fact that like the flow that you're in is sort of already there with the music itself. Um, and in the, you know, for the, in the case with me and how I work with Jimmy, my partner in metric, you know, I, I present stuff to him. Like I do the like hunched over toil thing, um, you know, <laughs> and then I'll, when we're in the mode of being in the studio, I'll do that at home and I'll come in and I'll be like, a lot of times I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm not even pitching this. I just feel an obligation. This hmm. thing presented, I followed it through. It's there's scaffolding, you know, there's infrastructure to this. It exists. Um, and I, so I'll present it and it's actually a really interesting uh, dilemma because I purposely don't finish it because I'm trying to do a collaborative thing here with my writing partner where I don't want to like, if I can present to him a finished, you know, song singer songwriter song on the piano with a fully you know realized piano part and the whole thing is done and just be like there's really he'd have to disassemble it so it's like you know i'll put together something with the scaffolding with the thing bring it in and sometimes he's like yeah i don't i cool but what you know and other times it's instantaneous like the song right now all comes crashing from our new album i mean i when I was writing that, it was total a hunch over, but it was not a labored process. It was, it was just really like a precise feeling, which is you're the person I want to be with when it all falls apart. Not if, when. <laughs> little little darkness in there. Right, right, right. Um, you know, and uh, so that was the idea. But the recording, I just did it. It was really rudimentary. Sometimes I put more effort into presenting it in a nice way, but it's really rudimentary. And I had no confidence. I had that in a couple of the songs, but no confidence about any of it. I was just like, what are you going to do? This is, this is what I have. And he and one of the producers we were working with where they were like, 
that song immediately. They totally knew what to do. And it's been five weeks at number one in, at rock radio in Canada since it came out. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah. So I want to talk about the poetry again. It distresses me greatly. Like I said, I've interviewed like 300 songwriters. I could count on one hand the number of songwriters that read poetry. And I, literally, I could probably name them. There are so few of them. And I am, and they're voracious readers. We'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, to me, it's pretty obvious the best songwriters are those who read in some fashion. Like I don't care what it is, they do read. But so few read poetry, and I find that to be just odd because you would think there's some overlap in the economy of language. Just um, you know the way good. I mean the euphony, how it sounds good. So maybe Emily convinced the songwriters out there. I don't know. Maybe not. Should they be reading? I, I think they should. I mean, I read poetry and it's, a, and unfortunately I feel like that's a dwindling number, number of people that read it, but w- how do you think maybe reading poetry could help a songwriter? I actually think the reason you're getting that response from all your amazing conversations with these people is because it's almost too on the nose. It's like, you know, I don't want to watch a music documentary which my boyfriend doesn't understand. He's fascinated. I'm like, you know, we watch, we watched Spinal Tap on a tour bus once. It was like, that killed the vibe. It's not funny. <laughs> You're like, it's too close, you know? So I right. do think there might be an element of that. Of like, certainly for me, like I'm, I'm trying to be immersed in everything but that so that I can make that. And it isn't always helpful to be confronted with it as someone else's, you know, I need, I need the richness so that I can cut it down Mm -hmm. and that's already cut down. So unless I feel like plagiarizing, which I don't, it's, it's not, there's no material there for me. It's not rich. It's not fatty enough. It's too lean. (laughs) All right. That's a good answer. So for you, I guess, do you read, do you read poetry? I read Paul Haynes. Okay. 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 So that's, yeah. Well, how about other types? Uh, yeah, I mean, do you do you? Well, think there's there some is... memoir. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. Sorry. No, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Well, some some memoirs like um, Deborah Levy, um, "The Cost of Living." She so it's. I mean, it's what you know. How you, <laughs> you must know this. I mean, look at the topic of your podcast. But like, how excited you get when you talk about a writer you love? Like, I'm just yeah. like all shivery now and excited. But so Deborah Levy, it's it's like it's a technically a memoir. I guess, but the way that she's written it is so interspersed with these um, impressions. It's she's working so much around the conventional confines of that genre, which is totally my speed because that's a bit of a project for me too. But she's just describing the environment that she's in, you know, kind of post divorce with her kids and the environment of the way people are speaking to her the way it makes her feel i don't know how she achieves this in what to me is essentially poetry like it's it's so spare but it's still technically prose it's unpretentious because that's the other thing is i feel like there's something sometimes rubs me the wrong way about the like these words are so important and they're laid out so exactly like like yeah sure totally it needs to be that way and i certainly do that with my lyrics but like when they're written on paper, which is not my favorite thing, but, uh, but yeah, Deborah Levy and a lot of memoir writers. Um, I, I really, I like, and strangely also a lot of self-help books, like cringy self-help books are, are fascinating to me because they're always coming up with these slogans and a lot of like, um, a lot of songwriting, not necessarily the area that I want to lead you far into, but a lot of what you see in like the pop hits, I mean, they're basically, you know, live, love, laugh level of like slogans, like something you could put on your kitchen in your wall, you know, your right. like kitchen motto. Um, and uh, it was actually a really interesting thing that Rick Rubin said about that within his, um, on his podcast, he did an interview with uh, Leonard Cohen's son, Adam Cohen. And they were just discussing um, Rick's time with Leonard and that in terms of the songwriting, he he said this phrase, I'd never heard anyone say that he like started moving into the sort of slogans, which I thought was such a, like some part of his career where he started going for those slogans, which is, which is 
definitely part of the craft of pop songwriting. Um, you know, is this my life? Am I breathing underwater? Is something that everyone at our shows sings because it's it's very clear and a concise feeling. So those, yeah, truthfully, those self help books, I notice where I'm like, wow, well done, you really nailed that. You know, I think that there are certain authors that I, there are certain authors that I songwriters tend to I hear a lot of like Kurt Vonnegut, you know, Bukowski. Um, Cormac McCarthy, uh, I heard Joan Didion some, but there are some that I, and there's connection there, right? The economy of language in Bukowski. I know Bukowski, well, more so Cormac McCarthy, Vonnegut, things like that. So um, I guess, do you, do you, are there certain genres or writers besides those that you tend to gravitate towards? Are you strictly in that memoir kind of self-help space, like any fiction writers and things like that? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's not unlike my, uh, what attracts me in, in music and in people and in everything is I can't really explain what it is. And I don't really, uh, compartmentalize it into like genres so much as something just draws me and I'll be <laughs> surprised of like, that works for me for whatever reason. Um, it is funny, the Bukowski one, because the only, the only Bukowski for me is post office. I mean, not the only one, but the only one that I uh, really hit. And I actually re have reread that and thought to myself, this is like listening to an album. Like it's, huh. it's, a, no, it's a novella. And there are very yeah. few books that I feel like you can read where you go back and listen like that. I felt yeah. like I was listening. Um, but so Carlo Rovelli is this physicist uh, who, did, who wrote like, um, Reality is Not What It Seems, The Order of Time. Um, and, uh, he's, he's perhaps my favorite writer because that is true poetry to me is like, he's taking these concepts, you know, being like, listen, guy, I don't know how to tell you, but time is a construct and I'm going to try to help you understand. And he's not like having an opinion. He's, he's walking you through the highest levels of of science and physicists that have lived before him and the, and the breakthroughs that they've had in their understanding of the universe. And, you know, his purpose is to make it so that someone like me is, can at least cling to the sides of the concept. Like, <laughs> right, right. You know, which yeah. to me is the idea of, of a song of a poem that's effective is you're taking all this stuff and you're actually making it like, available like digestible you know like so his his stuff he he will you know there'll be there'll be phrases where i'll just reread that you know 10 times and know that like maybe 30 percent of it is maybe going to register yeah i mean the key is i think we should make the distinction that it's not like you know blank for dummies you know right exactly they, right it's like a yeah. good teacher will will make you you know there's actually a, a reference to that of of exactly that in that realm of academia of like it being a requirement for some program that you be able to to explain you know um string theory for example to a group of laymen like if you really understand it you you will find a way um, to Think to about, get to that. Yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. I mean, to, the the smartest people, the most respected people, are people who can take their field and explain it to anyone. That's um, it. So, because I do absolutely. think that implies like a greater understanding on their part, instead yeah. of being like, you know, highbrow about it. It's like you truly haven't understood it unless you can say it that way, which is, which in fact has been a process for me with writing too, of like, you know, starting out being like pretty, pretty out there stuff, like theme wise, when, you know, you're, you're indie rock, rock band, you know, the instrumentation is kind of somewhat conventional other than it blew people's minds that I played a analog synthesizer when we started out, which now no one would even blink, but it was like, you can't like, right what's happening? Is it rock or is it since we don't know? It was like, guys, it's going to be okay. Um, <laughs> it's so funny, but you know, I, even on our first album, right? Like the first song is called, the album's called old world underground right yeah. now. And the first, the first song is called I O U, um, which I never say I O U in the song. I've been looking back on this cause it's 20 years ago, 
but there's like a whole part about a 10 year old enemy soldier. That's like our bridge. Every 10 year old enemy soldier thinks falling bombs are shooting stars, but she doesn't make wishes on them. Um, when she wishes, she wishes for less ways to wish for and more ways to work toward it. And, you know, it's kind of, kind of a lot going on there for like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of right. Song. And I, and I really early on starting out, I would really tax the patience of my bandmates with those pushing the limits of like the kind of stuff I wanted to write about. I have over time moved toward more, um, more straightforward, uh, communication in the songs, um, kind of in the same feeling as, as what we're describing, where it's like a great song you know, it's, it's fun to like play around with like all these literary things and stuff you can do with sonics and puns and whatever. It's cool, but it's tricky, you know? And I have really battled, like, ultimately what we want people to feel is amazing. We want them to feel like, oh, put that song on, turn it up. And I, it's complex maybe, but I'm, I'm welcome here. Not necessarily having someone like scratching their head while they try to listen to the song. So I really go back and forth on that. And you just got me thinking about it. Cause like David Berman, right. Silver Jews. Yeah. I mean, his actual book of poems, in fact, was called actual air, um, was um, f- phenomenal to me in terms of poetry in big air quotes. But, uh, but he, you know, he does such amazing twists and turns in his writing is passed on, but, yeah. um, but for whatever reason, I never felt alienated by the way he did it. But, you know, the presence of humor and the presence of all these elements are part of it, I guess. So you mentioned you gave me the image of you hunched over a few times writing. <laughs> so here, here's my question. Um, are you hunched over when you write lyrics? Are you hunched over a keyboard or are you a pen and paper type of person? Oh, it's a piano. It would never be a keyboard. I, I well, no, I'm sorry. Computer, computer keyboard for lyrics. Oh, like when you're writing no, no, lyrics. No. Yeah. Oh, right, right. No, it's, I, I basically, I work, I worship at the shrine of the piano and it's actually a great structure for that. And it's just kind of like, it's this, which I've shown you the hunched over. Unfortunately, your listeners can't see my incredible dance moves here, <laughs> but, uh, and, and then I just am writing actually a friend got me, um, like a pen that they use in space so that the gra- like gravity pen so that Someone I can write. Else. Oh, I got to go back to my interviews. You're the second person that said that who, who is an amateur of the space pen. Oh, now I got to go back and, and see oh, who that amazing. was. It, yeah, it was an amazing gift because obviously the paper is in front of me on the piano and then I can just, it's, and it's, you're kind of scrolling um, for me, very abstract things. It's not like, it's rarely a, co- a cohesive thing. It's just like fragments for the purpose of remembering. Um, and there's so much repetition where it's just staying in it. And it's, it's like, you know, it's almost like sculpture or something. You're like, it's, it's in there. It's in the piano. You just got to yeah. like massage it out. It's really weird. <laughs> but when it comes to lyrics, you are a pen and paper person, not a, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I could, I've said this all the time. I could do a whole website dedicated to, to the brand loyalty that songwriters have to brands of pen and colors of ink. I mean, it's, it's, it, to me, it's a confidence thing. I mean, I absolutely have a ritual. Um, I write in one chair, but revise in another chair. I just want to get distance Smart. from that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, I don't know, I, because I'm big on, the closer you are to your writing process, the harder the revision process is. So I will do things as differently as possible, whether it's a different time of day, different chair. Mm -hmm. Um, So part of me as a writer knows that that is true, that if you were too close to the, you know, like I'll never revise on the, on the, on the screen, I'll print it out or do it on an iPad just to get away from it. Um, So I I do think that works on a practical level because you do need to have distance, but I do think also um, a ritual is important because for me, it's confidence. You know, I do need to have have some routine and know what works for me. You know, I'm a morning person when it comes to writing certain things I have to have with me that are more effective. So I'm curious, you know, for you at least, how important is some kind of ritual to your process at all, if any? Yeah. I mean, I just, I kind of clear the, 
clear the deck, so to speak. It's like my house, I have a piano on each floor um, because I don't like to be too far from one ever. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And then, you know, it's sort of ignoring yourself. It's sort of just making things quiet around me um, so that I can just get out of the way. Um, And then sort of going over and being and finding out what's under my hands. Hmm. Um, and then it's almost like I found myself using this image, which is like, sounds like it's from like Dickens era or something, but like, do you remember taking a, a nickel and putting a piece of paper on it and rubbing a pencil over to like, of show course, oh, of course, naturally, I mean, <laughs> naturally, have you even lived? Um, yeah. So- <laughs> I'm insulted. You asked me that question, but go ahead. No, yeah. Of course. Right. <laughs> Um, so it feels like that where I'm just kind of, I'm the pencil or something. And it's just sort of, something's coming into, into being. Um, and then I, I, you know, get it to a point where it sort of exists, but is usually kind of gibberish. Like there might be a few words, but I have a visual of something coming together and a sense of the shape of the progression. And, you know, there are components that you need, like you're, I don't, I, as much as I am experimental with the writing and the themes and the sonics as we are, I'm still pretty committed to like, there's a reason that a perfect pop song has a certain structure. And even if, you know, we have a 10 minute song on our new album, we open the record with a 10 minute song. What are you going to do? But so even that though, it's very, very disciplined on what the structure is. So part of the process for me in that initial stage is like, you know, if it can't just be one thing, it's got to be like, some idea of where the hinge is, where this is going to go to a pre-course to get me somewhere else. Like we can't, we can't just verse all our lives or chorus all our lives. There needs to be that. So once I feel like that's sort of come together and I just record it on like rudimentary thing or on my phone or whatever, then I'm like you, it's kind of like go walk around or something. And then I'll just listen I'll listen to it from a distance and things will appear. More clarity will come. I'll see or the nickel and then I'll go back, record and record and record. You know, like it's not uncommon for me to do probably like 50 times of going through it and clarifying every single time. Um, till the point that it's like, okay, that I've now gotten to the point where I can leave that without something being clearly in need of repair or revision. So you look at it that many times. Uh, you said up to 50 times you're looking at something. Sure. I mean, I'm really? not, I'm just, but I'm in it. Like by 50, yeah. I mean like, you know, I'll look at my voice notes and it'll be like, oh yeah, I've, you know, it's just like, because I'm keeping all of it as I go because nothing's getting replaced. So it's just sort of like adding on, you know, I don't ever listen back to those unless I need to, um, to be like, I lost the plot, you know? Um, but yeah, it's more, it's like, it's more like meditative than, than anything, you know, like that's, and because it's a song, it's like, you just, the 50 is like over and over. It's not very many times to play a song actually. Is there any organization? Because when I do these interviews, songwriters show me the voice memos and it's just hundreds of voice memos on their phone with no organization at all. And part of me just, I grab the end of the table and I go, please tell me that there's some organization. Like you're not just flipping through going, where was that thing? So some of them do, but not that many. So no organization whatsoever. The only thing that's in there, I'm actually quite comforted to hear that your other guests have the same process, but like, uh, I'll, and when it's something is actually, it, when it exists, I'll give it like a name of some kind okay. so that I can at least know, like, that's where I hit solid ground. That's when the vapor became like a solid. And then I can know at least as a sort of marker, how far back to go or forward from there. And then, then there'll be, you know, ideally a few more steps from there or maybe i'm already there it's rare that i would already be there though the first titled one so i'll have like longer verse or something else uh modifications in the title 
And then you know that at least if it's been given a name, then it it gets stepped up in priority. Then, it does because right? then it's, so, it's it exists. <laughs> yeah. See, this is all about the ritual. I find it. I think it you have to know. I mean, that people I have these conversations. Songwriters have they tell me they have no ritual, and then they tell me these things, and yeah. it, you know, and it's so funny. I go listen to yourself talk. Um, so a couple more questions. I have found also that during the, especially over the past couple of years, people have been not traveling as much. Songwriters, a lot of song ideas come to them do, doing mundane activities. And by mundane, I mean uh, vacuuming, um, gardening, um, folding laundry, that we tend to get ideas when we're not trying to think of ideas. Uh, you know, I, all the time I hear showering, people get ideas in the shower or swimming or exercising. So I'm curious, do those ideas, do you get a lot of song ideas come to you in those mundane activities? And why do you think that is, if that happens? Well, it's funny. This actually links back to earlier in our conversation, because that's really what I meant by saying that I'm, I don't journal. I'm just like immersed and, and seeing what comes to me. I would say that that's my approach constantly. In fact, is I, I have, I do feel like it's sort of a two brain reality where it's, you know, I, I, I really don't like the feeling of straining for an mm -hmm. idea. I don't think it's, I think when you're, when you're, you know, earlier on, I think when you're developing your abilities and your skill and like all those ideas of like, no matter what, sit in the chair and do something. I think all that effort is really important, but I've, I feel that I've earned a different state or well, earned is maybe a weird choice, but like for whatever reason, I'm in a different state and it's had good results where it's always that I'm not, look, if I never write another song, it's because nothing came and taking that attitude thus far has made me a very prolific writer. I mean, for everything I've, that comes out. I mean, there's just so much other material because we're really harsh on the editing. And it always is that feeling of like, look, man, I'm just in life. What's worth something to someone, you know, like that, that's a, such a huge thing is like to, to make the distinction between self-indulgence um, and self-obsession and self-absorption that is unfortunately, I think a major, you know, like occupational hazard for writers is just because you made it doesn't mean it's good and doesn't mean it needs to be read or heard or, you know, maybe it serves a purpose in your process, but it's not all gold. And I think there's like a humility to it for me. Like, look, I'm just, I'm just in life. And what could I offer someone? Why should someone press play on this? What am I even, what's my contribution? If it's an insight, is it just something clever and intellectual that doesn't really do much? You know, or is it, is it actually like, is it transformative? Can someone, mm -hmm. you know, be in one state before they hear the song and be in another by the end of it, which could go mm -hmm. both ways. Obviously you think of someone being cheered up, but you could also work the other way where they're like, damn it. I was feeling great. I was having a good day. And then I put on this country song. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But I'd be like, mission accomplished. Like, sorry, doom scroller. What do you want? Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, <laughs> For me, at least, when it comes to that that ritual, like I, I run every day, and I find running is a tremendous source of of um, you know inspiration and ideas. And, and and as a matter of fact, like I will often, if I am writing, I will time my run so that it's at a point in my writing when I'm stuck, because I know that when I run, that's a way for me to work out the kinks and kind of get and. You know, and there's research behind that, the impact that exercise has on cognition. But um, I do find that using it deliberately, I, not that I don't go for, I don't, I don't go running four hours a day. You know, I'm in a rut. Let me go for another run. But I find that when I go out and exercise, um, it's amazing how that tends to unblock me. Same. I'm a runner as well. Morning, first thing, just it's like get organized. Yeah. I just stop thinking. It's weird, yeah. and that's kind of what I meant by the two brain thing. Is just like. You know, I don't know, really early on, I came up with this thing that I would say to the guys in the band, it's just like, you can't think your way out of a paper bag, which I don't really know what the fuck that means. But I, but I do know what it means. Cause it is sort of like you're where you're trying to get to you're a certain kind of thinking isn't going to get you there. It's this mm -hmm. other sort of, uh, it's such an odd phenomenon, isn't it? Um, the, the act of creation is just so, it's just we need it. You know, and I think of, I feel such compassion for my fellow humans that we're like, 
you know, you picture it, but people are like, ah, oh, I got to express something. And they're like taking cat guts and shredding them out on a stick to make a guitar and like banging <laughs> stuff and, right. you know, ink and paper. Like our souls are just like, help, I got to say this. And we all need to absorb it and create it. It's just so strange. Like, what is our problem? My dog is lying there. Like, what? He's like, can you go for a walk? Like, what? <laughs> right, what right. are you doing? Uh, so I know. I was over there too. Uh, so, the, speaking of poetry, there's a great book I read. Um, it was probably 20 years ago called The Friendship. It's about the, the guy's name is Adam and Adam Sisman. It's about the friendship between Wordsworth and Coleridge, and how um, both of them composed almost all of their poems on walks. And um, Wordsworth needed a rocky terrain. Coleridge needed a flat terrain, but they estimate Wordsworth walked a hundred thousand miles in his lifetime. Well, what else is there to do back then? I mean, and, you know, yeah. I'm mean, not much else to do, but, but he would deliberately go and it, it, his memory is so incredible. He would revise in his mind and he wouldn't come back till the poem was finished. Um, and he, they talk about the, like that they used walking as a way, as a part of their process. So it's been going on for a long time. Um, wow. Found, that's uh, yeah. Th thank you for telling me that. That's really, I mean, I've had, certainly had that experience on, on when I'm running of working through things, but I, but never had occurred to me that I could take it to that next level, which would really suit songwriting yeah. because th in the end I end up memorizing and I know everything, like I sing everything. So it's not like I'm not going to be in a position of memorization anyway. So yeah, it's yeah, kind of, it's wild. And I wrote about this for the Washington Post about five years ago. So there's mm. a direct there's a direct link between exercise and executive function, higher order thinking. So this is in the lab. This is not snake oil science. So this is especially applies to what you and I are talking about. But um, what these research have, researchers have done is they put people on a treadmill at for twenty percent at about sixty for sorry for twenty minutes at about sixty percent max heart rate, which is not much more than a walk. So it's not a lot. And then after 20 minutes, they give them a battery of, of tests to, add to, to test cognition and executive function. Those people always score higher than people that didn't exercise. So for about nine, and there's a chemical in the brain called brain-derived neurotrophic factor that's secreted only through exercise. So, so, so the ideal is, and this is all in the lab. So this is, and it's fascinating stuff because it has enormous implications, not just for like music, but for the work people who work in an office all day. So. 30 minutes is ideal and it's great because it's not dose responsive. So 60 minutes isn't twice as good as 30 minutes and 90% max heart rate isn't better than 60%. And for about 90 minutes post-exercise, the effect lasts. So there's like, this all makes sense. It's not just, oh, why do I think better? It's in the lab. And so I, that's what I use. And so about 90 minutes post-exercise, but there's a few caveats. One is that it has to be, it can't be an exercise that taxes you mentally. So if you run in the city, the effect is wiped out because you're trying to not be hit by cars. Um, and even treadmills are not as good as ellipticals because in a treadmill, you're on some level trying ever so slightly not to fall off. Um, so all that stuff is out there. It's fascinating. This is so, this is great to have the value of my personal experience because I have a place in the woods and I run there. And it's that feeling I'm similar to you where I have friends who are serious athletes and I'm, I'm serious in the fact that I love running, but I don't have any sort of goals. I don't, I don't time it. I don't do anything. I just, I love it. I open the yeah. door and I, and I want to, I wake up and I want to run. Um, and it's the, it, the setting there is just beyond belief. And on top of those benefits you're describing, there's always this wash of like, I can't believe my, that everything works and that, you know, <laughs> right, right. You, you know how it is with running. It is a, it is an element of body scan too, where it's just like a little weird thing in your ankle or something in your back and you're kind of pooched. Like the yeah. only thing I've had, despite, you know, crowd surfing, et cetera. Uh, and the et cetera is not small. Um, is lately I've had this really weird little click in my ear when I'm running, like kind of in my jaw, like I, and, but I'm just like, okay, may that be, my worst problem exactly physically but so and that experience as you say it's probably i mean I, i've ended up realizing it's probably about 30 minutes because yeah. sometimes you glance at the clock before but it's there there's there are no cars there's nothing it's just me and the and the dirt road and the river and i do come back 
being like, I figured it out. You know. My right, last question, the, the exact opposite of this is that I read an article in Smithsonian. It was a study about a year ago. And every time I tell the story, I forget what it's called, but this phenomenon that we're in right before sleep. It's not when you're asleep and it's not, it's, there's a term for it when you're right before sleep. And so in this study, they referenced Salvador Dali. He had this thing that he would do where he would, um, he would get in an uncomfortable chair. There's a picture of him in the magazine. It's hilarious. It's this uncomfortable chair and he'd hold a skeleton key in his outstretched hand. And when, and with a saucer on the floor underneath it, and when he would drift off, you know, he'd let go of the key, the key would drop, he'd make a sound, he'd start to create. And so they found, they've replicated this in the lab somehow, but they found there is this state that we're in, not in the middle of the night, but right before we go to sleep, where we're tremendously fruitful and creative. So I'm just curious if you've ever had experiences like that, or it could be middle of the night, I guess, but where you've had those ideas come to you in that state. Well, this is so funny that you're saying this today, because I was in the studio yesterday. And I've actually never really talked to anyone um, about this because it just seemed like such an inner band thing. And maybe other musicians have this experience. But one of the ways that I know that I'm in it is if I fall asleep in the studio. And uh, it's something that we've all kind of known. Like I, if Jimmy, if I, if I'm, if I'm, like recording something or I'm doing vocals and I see that Jimmy's kind of drifted. It's like, okay, that's really good that he's drifted off, which you would think, Oh goodness, someone's not paying attention or this isn't compelling or right. And yesterday we were doing um, a different kind of process because we're doing acoustic versions of some songs from Formatera, which is something we do on every album. But so it's not like, you know, pure creation from scratch and it's not very production heavy. It's like piano and guitar. And, um, but it's also can be kind of hard to get into it because it's a bit, plain you know it's like and we're not in a deep session we're just you know gonna go in for a few hours which was yesterday you know I'm busy a bunch of stuff I come in it's new and the lights are bright and we're just like trying to remember what we wanted to do for all comes crashing and so the song and and then something happened where he started doing the guitar and that state came over me you know I'm fully well rested I wasn't like sleepy quote unquote and that state came over me and then he went and I kind of like drifted into that place and came up with what I wanted to do on the piano and the mood of this and how to deliver the vocals. Like it all just kind of wasn't like verbally clear, but became clear. And then he came in from the sound booth, like recording the guitar. And I was like, Oh, great news. I fell asleep. He's like, Oh, no way. Amazing. I was like, guys, it's going to be a great session. I fell asleep. They're like, oh, right on. Like, no, no laughs. Everyone's like, oh, mate, that's great news. Like, seriously, that's fantastic. So I'm really shocked um, and excited that you have uh, really you've got a lot of a lot in common here of the themes that are interesting to us because uh, I never thought I would talk about that with someone. In closing, I feel like if you know those things about yourself, about what works, why not? try to do those things. Right. I mean, I love that, that you guys were like, Oh, they, f- they fell asleep. Excellent. We're good. Like, who's going to say that? Who's going to say, you most are going to say what the hell wake up. But I love the yeah. fact that you recognize that and you were like, Oh yeah, they're falling asleep. That means, that means we're good to go. It's, who, it's good. Why would you say that? That makes no sense, but it clearly is effective. And that's it for the latest episode of songwriters on process. Don't forget, you can find all of my interviews with over 200 songwriters on my Songwriters on Process website at songwritersonprocess.com, going all the way back to 2010. You can read them, watch them, or listen to them. So until next time, thanks for listening.